Right, my friends, I keep changing my setup because I am not happy with the sound quality I've been getting, even though I like the way the videos I've been making look a little better, and I find the angle that I've been making them a little more flattering than this bad webcam on my Mac, but maybe I just need to invest in a good webcam. Since we're never going to be able to... I'm just kidding. Um, so one of the quest requests that I get from friends and and um, commenters a lot is to kind of go back and revisit the Ruminations video that I did on the tarot cards. And if uh, it started... I don't even remember when I did it. It was probably four or five years ago. Um, but basically I went through and I had like six examples of each card and I just sort of talked about how each card in the suit of wands, each card in the suit of swords, etc. kind of connected and, and, and reached from, reached to me, uh, in their way and how I'd kind of managed to reconcile the different versions. And it's interesting because I, I think it's a good time to kind of revisit that, um, because I have changed so much and my reading has changed so much. But by the same token, one of the things that I've done over the last couple of years is really um, tried to step away from any expectation that the cards mean anything at all. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of try to talk about what the cards mean when I believe that they don't really mean anything until they come into context with each other. But it's an interesting challenge. And again, I'm trying to sort of put out some content to just give people stuff to listen to and distract them from the world. And so I thought, let's try. How how would I talk about the tarot deck now um, in a way that I couldn't then and didn't then? And, and in a way, I think it's harder now because I, the more I learn, kind of the less I know. Uh, it's interesting. So uh, let's, I'm going to start with the trumps in this video, and then I think I'll do... I might break this into parts. I'm not sure yet. We'll see how long I ramble. And then I might do each of the suits. We'll see how this goes. So I, we're going to start with the fool. And um, in, in a way, I feel like the fool is a perfect metaphor for being a tarot reader because there is absolute and total lack of expectation. There's absolute and total lack of bias. When I, Whenever anyone comes to me for a reading, I always have to sort of remind myself that just because I think something doesn't mean that it's going to show up in the reading. And the more I know somebody, the more likely I am to sort of say, oh, yeah, I don't need to do a reading. I can tell you exactly right now what you should do or why this isn't going to work. Uh, but then the reading almost never lines up with what I thought it was going to say. And so as a reader, it's like our job to kind of neutralize ourselves and to just sort of like, like go, go start from blank, lay out the cards and let them do the talking. And I think that that's kind of an apt metaphor. And that's what's depicted in The Fool is this complete and total lack of expectation. You know, when you look at Pamela Coleman Smith's image, um, it's, it's kind of brilliant. I think it's one of the most brilliant changes that they made in the Waitsmith deck from a Marseille deck, which is that the fool is stepping off a cliff um, because the fool doesn't know what happens if you step off a cliff. There's no expectation that anything bad or good is going to happen. They just know that they're, they're walking forward. They're taking that step. And I think that that's sort of what the fool is, is a complete and total lack of expectation, a complete and total lack of bias, a complete and total lack of knowledge, just pure innocence, pure unknowing, um, and just sort of, it is zero. It has no, is there's nothing before it or after it in a way. And so that's how I think about the fool. And I, I like it as a metaphor for being a reader because I feel like we need to do that every time we sit down with the cards to sort of like clear ourselves of expectation. In a reading, it's a little bit different, I would say, um, because the window's open. Uh, because again, it's so much of it depends on context. It's true. It's true. Like, is the fool telling you that you are being a fool, that you're an idiot? Or is it telling you that you really need to just rush forward and, you know, damn the consequences? Uh, some, you know, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna matter based on the way it's functioning, um, in the spread, what he's doing, what he's with, who he's with. So it's really hard to tell you what I think the cards mean when I really don't know, because there's no context. So the magician 
Um, I I always come back to the magician is one of my favorite images uh, uh, in many decks. It's it's a card I always look to, and I come back to Pamela Cole. Um, surprise! Uh, it's just like blue tack that's holding those things up, so they'll probably all fall by the end of this. I'm surprised they've stayed up as long as they have. Um, Rich Pollock, not Pamela Coleman Smith, although equally as brilliant, did uh, wrote at one point. I can't remember in one of, which one of her books it was, but that the magician is sort of like manifesting, is serving as a conduit of energy, and it's passing through. So I think of it as a writer who, you know, there are days where you're just typing and the muses are working and you're just like soaking energy from the sky and putting it on the page. And I think anytime anyone who does anything that they care about has a moment where they manage to get out of the way and just be a conduit for some seemingly greater energy, then that's that magician moment. But in a reading, it's often never that. It's, it's funny. It's It's like... This is not going to be a helpful video for anyone who's learning. Because <laughs> I do think that that's what Pamela Coleman Smith drew. But I also think that in a reading, it can be a little magic. It can be a little swindle. It can be a performer um, faking it till you make it. And that's sort of how I think about it in a lot of readings. That's how it tends to show up. Um, because there are very few times in life where we have the control over the muses in a way to to allow that like you can't force that magician-ness that i described into being you have to sort of get out of the way and let it happen and it happens or it doesn't um so it's again i'm just gonna keep saying it's funny to talk about the cards this way because it is it's in a reading usually for me it will be per something performative or um a plumber, you know what I mean? Like someone who has a toolbox, um, someone who is deceptive or deceiving or who um, distracts. You know, I have a very base and banal reading of that card usually. The High Priestess is an interesting one and it is one of the ones that has taken me the longest to figure out how to read. Um, and I struggled for a long, long, long time because in the context of readings, I would find her so aloof, partly because what I got from the books I was reading was that she is a mystery and she's withhold she's withholding information from you. Um, and I was like, what, is, what the fuck does that mean in a reading? Until it sort of clicked for me one day that that withholding is actually the act. And that is usually representative of how the high priestess functions in a reading to me. Now, it was pointed out to me when I talked about this in another video that there's kind of a gendered stereotype there, and I guess that's fair. Um, but I don't think that the cards are gendered. Um, you know, my they, they represent anyone and anything, and it's not... It's not the act of a high priestess being withholding, it is the act of withholding. And the only reason I came to that conclusion ultimately was because it did, it never made sense in any other way. You know, like the high priestess, when it would show up in a reading, I would be like, fuck. Because the answers that I would give when she would show up is like, and I recognize I'm using gendered pronouns right now. So I try to avoid that. The, um, the answers that I would give when the high priestess showed up was like, yeah, you know, you just got to trust that the answer is inside you. And that's fucking garbage, because as a reader, my job is to tell you something more specific than that. Like if the person knew the answer was inside them, they would just pull it out. As a reader, you know, I feel a really strong inclination that it's my job to have a better answer than some sort of nebulous, the answer was inside you the whole time, Tin Man, kind of thing. Like it just doesn't fly with me. And when I get readings like that, I get really pissed because that's not an answer. Um, and so I, you know, I had to, I had to come to terms with the high priestess in some way. And, and in reading all these descriptions of the mystery, and she's the keeper of the mystery, and, you know, there's the curtain in front of the lake, and if only you could pass the initiation, you can get by there. I'm like, that just sounds like any gatekeeper. It sounds like anyone who has the power to either give you permission or to deny it. And the high priestess denies it. 
And so it's the agent who doesn't like your manuscript. It's or who hasn't read it. It's the director who isn't going to cast you in the play. It's the boss who will never like you, even if you do your work, because they get off on the power of having power. And I know that that is going to make a lot of you really fucking hate my interpretation of the high priestess. But it has to make sense in a reading for me. And so many interpretations of the high priestess or the papess are too nebulous. They just are. It's not helpful in a reading. And if it makes you feel any better, it's not the high priestess itself. It's it's the the sort of pre-Golden Dawn um, popess. And I think that the pope and the priestess, or the pope, or the hierophant and the high priestess, both have that quality of withholding. The, the high priestess is an individual who can withhold, and the hierophant is an institution that can withhold. But both tend to exercise the power of denial, of telling you no, or maybe, and that use that to manipulate you. There are times where the high priestess just doesn't know the answer, um, and maybe for ego's sake does not want to let you in on that secret, and so pretends they have the answer. Um, but that's really, and I know, I know, and you can spare me the comments. I know that you're going to hate that. But in a reading, I need things that happen in real life. And that happens in real life. And um, there are a lot of people out there who get off on on having the, the inside scoop or having the information or having the access and being like, mm, you can't have it. I get access to the VIP lounge, bitches, and you don't. And there are people who do that. And that is a thing that is going to show up in a reading. Conversely, I have had an uh, opposite path with the Empress. Um, I don't now view the Empress as the stereotype of eternal motherhood. I think that the Empress is a fucking boss bitch. You know what I mean? Like that's she like the Empress has been neutered in a way that the High Priestess has been lifted up. And I and I think that it is sexist to make the high priestess just a mother. Now, a mother can be a boss bitch. I'm not saying she's not a mother. I'm saying that the high priestess is not just fecundity and fertility. There are times, I think, where that has shown up in spreads, but she's about owning your damn power in the face of obstacles. If you think about empresses through history or queens, they have had to work harder to achieve their rulership because of sexism, and bias. You know, I think about Queen Elizabeth I, right? Even Queen Elizabeth II. You know, one of the things I tried watching The Crown, and one of the most frustrating things about that show was that every episode was like, the Queen was like, I want to do this. And everyone's like, all the men are like, no. And she was like, okay. You know, and it drove me nuts because I wanted to see her like kick some fucking ass. It takes a while for her to get there. Um, you know, and that's part of the dramatic arc, but I'm like, you're the queen, damn it. Like, fuck everybody else. Um, I'm swearing a lot in this video. Fuck that. This really is just iced coffee. There's nothing in it other than that. Well, milk. So the empress for me is an empress. She's like, she's Lizzo. You know what I mean? She owns her shit. Um, she owns everything. Opulence. That's the empress. Yes. The emperor, um, also a ruler, um, usually a little more distant. I, I, you know, I guess in context of each other, if the empress and the emperor show up in a reading, I might see them as a mother and a father. The emperor to me, it's funny, it's in the Japaridza deck, um, which is right here. Can I find the card? It is, she changed, the artist changed the name to, of this card to war. And I really hate that. Um, and yet it had taught, it taught me something about the emperor because I had to say, well, how can that work within my system? What is the emperor that is war other than patriarchal? And look, there are times when, again, the emperor does represent patriarchy because that's another thing that's active. You know, that's another thing that's showing up in the world. And so there are times where the emperor is patriarchy, but I do like to have a more neutral point with the cards and to go back to the high priestess for a second there are times where you have to have information withheld from you from your own safety you know what i mean like it that's legit so just because the emperor the uh high, high priestesses she's not a mean girl 
You know what I mean? She's just withholding information. So in the Japaridza deck, this is the card. It's war. And um, it's beautiful art. I just don't like that title for the emperor. And I guess the reason why, it's partly my own bias, because it's like the 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 kind of archetypal depiction of masculinity in the majors is war in this deck rather than the emperor and the empress uh, so we have the empress and war in this deck and i'm like well you know the 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 i don't know the patriarchal part of me wants to be like hashtag not all men when i see the war card right but i what it what it's taught it's you know pa the patriarchy is real and fucked up like let's just accept that but what this taught me about was like what is war beyond violence it's strategy you know, it's trying to think ahead, trying to think long term, trying to think about winning. And um, war is a metaphor in a lot of ways, uh, from everything to the boardroom to, to chess. And so it did teach me a lot about the card. And so I do think about the emperor that way. And I do think about the emperor in positive ways, too. I do think there is an aspect to the emperor that is just sort of archetypically masculine, not male but masculine in the same way that the high priestess and the empress are not archetypally female, but are feminine as it were. Um, and, and I mean that in the sense of like, you know, you, you, you can, I, I mean, just like the fluidity of gender and how it is not a binary as, as we imagined it was. All of that is in us. There are times when we are withholding. There are times when we're a badass boss bitch. There are times where we're uh, a warlord, you know, or whatever, however you want to look at it. Um, the Hierophant is, like I said, where the, um, the High Priestess sort of is um, an individual who withholds the... Hierophant is an institution that withholds. And because institutions behave differently, the withholding is different. Um, and so I do think of it, I mean, I, it's hard, it's always been hard for me to sort of neutralize the Hierophant because I do think of it as the Pope and I do think of all the like fucked up connections I have to the religion that I grew up with. Although, you know, it did teach me kindness in ways. I don't love the church. And so it's hard for me to sort of distance myself from the church. Um, and it does impact the way that I think about the Hierophant, and it does have a church equality. You know what I mean? Like there is a, there is a, you can belong to us if you follow certain rules kind of vibe to the card. If you obey these probably sort of random strictures, then welcome to the club, stay in line, follow the organizational structure. And if you don't do that, we're going to exile you. We're going to, um, what's the word? E exercise? Not exercise. I'm going to think of it as soon as this is over. Excommunicate. We're going to excommunicate you if you don't stay in line. Um, that's t how I tend to think about that card. There are times in readings where it is just generically faith, where it has just shown up as like, you got to keep the faith. And that has happened too. And so sometimes it's the idea of just having faith in something. Um, and that is how I neutralize the card. I'm just realizing you can see mess in my office that you can't usually see because this stupid thing is blocking it. So, yeah, just, that's mess you don't even get to see because it's not sexy like books. The Lovers is another tough card, I think. And it tends to show up for me in readings. I, You know, I know that choice is kind of a common thing, and that sometimes shows up for me but more often than not i think about it as partnership um as partners or pairs of things um particularly if there's a lot of twos in the reading um it can represent choice it can represent just love i think sometimes we overthink it and it's like i really like this thing you know sometimes the lovers in a reading is just like you really like this um and sometimes i think about it as the loss of innocence the adam and eve myth uh, so that's another way that it can show up and has shown up in readings for me. And, uh, um, yeah, again, context is, is so important. So it's like, I know I'm rattling off like these very disparate representations, but as I said at the beginning, it's kind of hard for me to get too, too like specific generally because I rely so much on what else is going on in the reading. 
The chariot is one of my birth cards. The other is the tower. And I do think of the chariot just as straight up movement as forward motion. Um, I mean, like pretty much that's how I see it. You know what I mean? It's motion, it's movement. It can be, you know, that more sort of esoteric thing of like marshalling your resources to like focus on a task. And so I think, you know, in, in a reading, it can show up as movement or it can show up as trying to get over distractions. You know, it's like that um, thing of trying to focus, you know, those two horses in the Waitsmith are like pulling you in different directions. You know, if you don't focus them on one, they're going to tear the chariot in half. So that's how I think about that. Uh, where were the chariot? What comes next? We'll go with strength next, although I tend to put strength as 11. Strength, literally just strength. I mean, there are, like, when, when, when strength shows up in a reading, it's strength. It's power. Um, I, I rarely find it to mean anything other than strength. Whatever contextually that means, but I do sort of think of it that way, you know? It just is strength. Um, it's, again, like, don't overthink it. Love is love. Strength is strength. Like, sometimes that's just what you need. So, you know, and, and when I say that, like, it could be strong or strength, you know what I mean? Like, there's variations on the theme. But. Um, nine is the Hermit. Um, the Hermit is probably my favorite card, um, especially, I just love, I just think Pamela Coleman Smith's drawing is, is about the most perfect Hermit. Like, there are more beautiful ones, but that card is tarot to me, that, that Hermit's so beautiful. Um, and so the Hermit can show up in a reading to me often as isolation or introversion, shutting yourself off. Or, you know, it can be a mentor, teacher, wisdom, depending, again, on context. But it's, it's, it's. I mean, again, I'm pretty literal about what that card suggests most of the time. You know, it's it's someone who is alone. It's aloneness. And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. You know, I remember doing a love reading, a, a relationship reading a bunch of years ago, and the hermit showed up as kind of a central card. And it was like, you gotta, you gotta be comfortable in that space by yourself. You just have to, because a wise woman named Cher once said, sooner or later, ooh, we all sleep alone. And it's true. You gotta, you gotta be comfortable being single um, so that you can be in a relationship or so that you can not be in a relationship. And so I think that the hermit is just aloneness and solitude. Uh, the Wheel of Fortune uh, is next. <laughs> Hello. And um, I think about that as sort of like the times that we're not in control, you know, that when the Wheel of Fortune shows up, probably things are not in your power to affect or impact. Uh, things are going to go the way they're going to go. Um, things are rapidly changing. Uh, if, if the Wheel of Fortune card shows up and you're doing a one card draw and it's like a when will question or will I, will I get the job? 100% undecided. You know, it's, it's, if you're doing a one card draw and it's a, a predictive reading and you get the Wheel of Fortune, probably you need to let the dust settle a little bit before you try to get a real answer. Um, but it does, I think one thing that we have to remember as, as readers is that there are just times when we're not, we're not actively presented with license, that we're not we don't have agency. We're not the main player. We're being done to. And sometimes it's important to remember that. One of the spreads that I offer in my shop comes from Benabel's Holistic Tarot, and it's a decision spread. And what I like about it is that one of the positions in the spread is what's out of my control, because it's legit. Like there are times where we just can't impact things that much. Um, 11. Um, Justice, yes, yeah, Justice. Um, when I think of, Justice was always a card that I found really hard to read as well. And what I think of it now is like, again, I sometimes when I'm struggling with a card in a spread, particularly a major arcana card, I try to say, what is, what is this literally? Like, what is this literally in life? And, and what I've come to with Justice is that it's just the right thing. You know, it is the right thing at the moment. And, and so the right thing is not always the best thing. It's not always what we want. Um, it's not always just, but it's the right thing. Uh, and justice, I think, is not as sort of black and white as we want it to be. Um, sometimes doing the right thing 
is not just, you know, I mean, if you, th I'm not, you know, I mean, there's this, there's that meme where, um, people talk about the difference between equality and, and sort of, it's, I'm trying to think, I can't even remember the words, but it's like, it's, it's a fence, like a, uh, picket fence that you can't see over and then there's like a guy who's tall seeing over the fence and then a short person who can't see over the fence and that's equality because they both have the same place to start they're both standing on the ground and then there's another one where the short guy is standing on a box and can see over the fence and it's like that's justice because the short person can't see over you you don't deny the short person the box just because they were born short. You give them something to stand up so they can see over the fence. Like, that's justice. That's the right thing. And that's how I think about that card. Um, but it doesn't... Like, the masses might say, well, you know, I'm not going to spend money on a box for you. I didn't make you born short. Um, but that's not the right thing to do. So that's how I think of that card. Um, 11, 12, The Hanged Man. Um, I don't have an especially mystical appreciation for that card. I do think of it as consequences. Whether, you know, whether he's up there because he wants to be or not, it's not fun being up there. That doesn't feel good. Um, and I do tend to go to the sort of pre-Golden Dawn image of it's a traitor. It's, a, it's someone who committed a crime and they're being punished for it. Um, and that's that's kind of how I think about that card. It's a consequence. We There aren't a lot of cards in the tarot that recognize that actions have consequences. And so I need that card to do that in a reading. And, and uh, that's what it does. Death, um, I think it's a stop. It's a punctuation mark. It's an ending. Um, it is, it is a, a period on the sentence. Um, I resist the idea of death as change um, because I think that it tends to neuter the card a little bit. I think we, we are so afraid, and I am definitely am, we're so afraid of death that when the card shows up in a reading, we're very quick to neutralize it. And ironically, I like it when we neutralize cards, but in neutralizing it, we actually neuter it. It's, it's something stopping. But another thing I will say is is that when I do read death, sometimes it just means slaying. Like, just fucking bringing it, you know what I mean? And, like, who cares about the consequences? So, like, I do this spread on Instagram a lot called How to Slay Today. And when the death card shows up, it's like, just slay, bitch. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of how I feel about that card, too. But I don't like it as changes so much because I think it negates the idea that sometimes things just stop. You know, and I'm thinking of a line from Alanis Morissette where she's like, death doesn't mean stopping or stopping doesn't mean death. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's ironic because sort of, yes, and in, in the tarot, I think it does. Like, it's not a literal death, um, but it is a literal stopping. It's a pause. It's a punctuation mark. It's the absence of action. Things have stopped. Um, and they will be different after it. But it doesn't, it's not for me the act of transformation per se, it's the act of the stoppage. I will say that the wild unknown depiction of death taught me a lot about the card as well. And in readings, it can sometimes mean sort of fertilization. You know, if you think about a dead, I mean, this is going to be gross, but dead things rot and rotten things fertilize the earth. And from that new life grows. And so in that way, there's that transformational link or that change link. Um, but it's, it does, it, something has to die in order for something to grow out of it. And so in a reading, it can sort of represent the act of fertilizing what's to come. All right, so that was 13. 14 is temperance. I mean, temperance is another one that's really literal. You know, it's, it's moderation almost always. It's being moderate. It is taking the middle path almost always. Um, there are times where in a reading it can be being kind of like a fuddy-duddy or a stick in the mud, like being too temperate. But again, it's sort of the same thing. It's like, it's still moderation, Some, but sometimes immoderation is necessary. Um, 15 is the devil, right? I mean, some of these numbers are wrong because I'm not looking at them. Uh, the devil, to me, really is a pre-Christian... Uh, 
thing. It's 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 wildness. It is bacchanalia. It's sex. It's vice. Um, it can be that entrapment of addiction sometimes because excess can be bad. But I do think of it as wildness and our animal nature and our just wicked sense of humor and, you know, just all the things that were considered part of life prior to organized religion sort of saying no there's evil and there's good and if you're evil you're you're going to hell and there's a devil who lives there you know and that's not what the devil represents to me it is it is wilderness it is wildness it is it is animal um and that's how i do that especially when it's partnered with the moon because the moon very much has that quality too so the devil, the tower, I mean, the, ta the, the tower probably is more changed to me than than death. Um, the tower has an explosive sexual energy as well. I know that that's very stereotypically male. Um, we do live in a patriarchal society, but I don't think it has to be just male sexuality. I think the explosion of orgasm is fair um, in, in any, in any, it doesn't need to be like literal ejaculation. Um, it can be crushing, crumbling, you know, it can be all those things we traditionally, I don't think I veer too much from the tower. Um, you know, uh, I don't think. The star, the star, I don't know why I said that that way, um, was another one that was really hard for me. Like, I just never bought the hope kind of thing. Like, it just is not, enough. it's just not specific enough for me and lenormand lenormand i never know how the fuck to say it that really taught me a lot about the star it's it's a compass it's a direction it's you're setting your course you're following the star and literally that's almost always how i read it the moon um is attraction it's pull it's it's again animal instinct um it is fantasy sometimes um but I think of the tides. I think about the, a powerful draw towards something. That's what the moon represents. And so, like, attraction would be more likely to be represented in a reading for me by the moon than the lovers. Although the moon and the lovers and the devil would, to me, suggest a really sexy relationship. The sun is sort of everything that you associate the sun with. It's warmth, it's heat, it's a spotlight. Um, it can be good and it can be bad. It can be too hot. It can be too bright. It can be too much. You can have too much sun. It can give you a sunburn or it can keep you warm and safe and, and all of those things. So that's, the sun is very literal to me. Um, judgment is very literal to me. I think I have a traditional, it's like you just wake up. You just wake up. You come, come alive. You come too. And then the world I tend to think of as everything. Like when the, when it's literally the word everything. When I see the world card in a reading, it usually means everything. Um, and that's it. Like l the world to me is the totality of anything. Um, so this was a little easier than I thought it was gonna be when I started, I was a little nervous. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, that's how I've come to see the Trumps. That's how I ruminate on them now. Um, again, it does change so powerfully based on the reading, based on what's happening. But I guess when I am in a reading, those are the first things I, I sort of check for are those kinds of correspondences. Um, and then I may try on other ones too. Sometimes I'll go to the hanged man as a different point of view. Sometimes I'll go to the devil as addiction. You know what I mean? But most of the time, those are my defaults. And I start teasing out the meaning from there. And again, I think, you know, like being a plumber, you just sort of reach for the tools that you need. And so those would be like my first tool that I would pick when reading the Trumps. So I hope this was interesting. I'll do the other four suits in a separate video. And um, stay well. Be good.